ever cringe from bad theology posted on social media? We do. And we're talking about it today on the Church Revitalization Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast, brought to you by the Malfurs Group team, where each week we tackle important, actionable topics to help churches thrive. And now, here's your hosts, Scott Ball and AJ Matthew. Welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast. My name is Scott Ball. I'm joined by my friend and co-host, AJ Matthew. AJ, um, I saw some bad theology on Facebook this morning. Yeah. And um, and it did make me cringe. Um, I, I'll just read it for the for the whole for the whole team here. Listen. Oh, you're gonna give it everybody. Okay. I'm I'm gonna read just the last sentence of there there were lots of things that this post had in it. It was one of these pictures. It was like a picture with words. Um, I, I know I, I, I'm hesitant to call it a meme because I usually think memes are funny, but can you have non-funny memes? I think you, I think, I think any picture on social media with words attempting to make you think or understand something would be a meme. Okay. I would have to ask my Anybody teenagers. who's younger than, uh, yeah, pe- young people listening to the podcast, <laughs> let us know in the comments. If you see a, like a, a quote that's typed up and it's a picture, is that a meme? I don't know. Okay. At any rate, here's what the the picture said Uh, at the very bottom. It said, Christ transforms, not the Bible. Be wary of those who know one, but not the other. Okay. So we don't need to totally break down all the problems with this statement, but I just want to just fundamentally say to know one is to know the other. So it's a false premise to say Christ transforms, but the Bible doesn't. It's like, yeah, actually, they both are transformative because the word is with God and the word was God. To know mm-hmm. the Bible is to know Christ. To know Christ is to know the scripture. You, yeah. you can't, they, they, they're well, like this. I, mean, I guess we could kind of even dig into the work of the Holy Spirit versus the work of the person of Christ. As sure, well. okay. <laughs> it, there's just a the, lot of the whole thing didn't, didn't work like and yeah. even and trust me i didn't read everything that was before that if you had read that you would have been like uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah wait a minute mm. so at any rate all that to say if you ever look at the things people post especially people in your congregation and you think wow oh my goodness why why did you say that why did you post that then um this episode is for you. We want to increase biblical literacy in your church and give you three tips for how to do that. This is a real problem in churches. Yeah, AJ? Yeah, for sure. Man, I can't I can't even say how many churches you and I together have worked with that uh, when we start digging into, you know, the ministries of the church, the primary ministries of the church, and we, and we come to find out that almost all the time, biblical literacy ministries, Bible studies, small groups, Sunday school classes are left totally unchecked. Uh, yeah, the right. the leadership of the church is, you know, senior level leadership of the church has almost no clue what's being taught. Totally. Yeah. Or they, or they'll like punt on it and just go, well, we have right now media and I got nothing against right now media necessarily. I know people are listening right now. And they're like, we have right now, me- right now media. <laughs> I'm not opposed to that necessarily, but the problem mainly I have with it is it's a little bit like as a parent saying, Anything that's in the kids section of Netflix is fine. Mm, it's like, yeah. well, not necessarily. Actually, there are things on Netflix that are in, even though it's in the kids section, so it should be okay. It's not something that I support. Yeah. So there are things that my kids are not allowed to watch mm-hmm. on on a streaming service, even if it has kids on it. And I think you should take the same approach to a Christian streaming service like Right Now Media, where you go, well, it's Christian. So probably yeah. all the content is good. Well, maybe probably most of it's fine, or maybe even all of it's generally okay, but it might not be your perspective on how you would want to teach that content to your yeah. people. Mm-hmm. So you take some ownership, just like I have to take ownership of what my kids watch on, on Netflix and go, yeah. not that, right? I mean, that's, that's a, at least a step above just various people in the church creating anything that they want. Um, oh, yeah, that's true. Which we've seen that too. And that we have. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. 
look, where'd that come from? That was totally out of left field and totally wrong. So, um, so today we want to help guard, help you guard against some of that. And also just, um, overall tips, even if you think, even if you think you're doing pretty well at this, some things you can do to help boost biblical literacy in your church. Let's, yeah. let's hop into it. Okay. Well, for, uh, and let's start off with maybe with some solid theology on the reasons for this. Um, mm-hmm. And so we're going to go right into something that is near and dear to us um, in uh, the work that we do, helping to to build up churches. Um, and in the area of mission, we believe that the Great Commission is the mandate given to all churches um, mm-hmm. around the world for all time to make and mature disciples of Jesus. And for that, uh, well, there's several Great Commission passages, but Matthew 28 is uh, it's kind of our our number one. So we have uh, we have the mandate to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then the big the, the big kicker: teach them to what Scott obey or observe, obey, obey or yeah. observe all that I've commanded you. So, um, and and so frequently, you know, this really I think it just kind of gets uh, I don't know a little smoothed out into teach them to know everything that I've commanded. And there's a difference. There's a difference in uh, just, you know, taking in a bit of knowledge and uh, taking in knowledge that leads to transformation and a change of actions. And that's what we're getting at in the heart of this first point. Yeah. Okay. So this is going to be a little weird for you listeners. AJ, you know, I I told you in advance, I was going to do this. So I want to use a bit of a metaphor if that's okay. Okay. It could be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I hope, I hope that this is helpful. So I won't give all of the details because I don't want to bore anyone, but there's a little bit of a zoning, rezoning dispute in my neighborhood. Um, Essentially, there's a new developer who wants to develop the remaining empty lots and property surrounding our existing neighborhood in a particular way that would require a different zoning. And the current neighborhood, our neighborhood, doesn't want that. We would like for it to continue to be developed under the existing zoning. So again, I don't need to get into all the details of that because literally no one cares. Here's where this is, I think, maybe a helpful analogy or metaphor. So prior to a sign going up at the end of my street about a zoning change, I didn't know anything about the current zoning. I didn't know anything about the future desired zoning by the developer. I didn't know what any of the, I didn't know what R2 meant. I didn't know what PRD meant. And if you had come to me and said, Hey, you know what? You are a person who lives in this city. You know, you really ought to study. We're going to have a small group and we're going to get together and we're going to study zoning regulations in the city. Yeah. I would, yeah, I would be like, (laughs) no, Thank you. Yeah. I have too many things that are more important in my life than to know the difference between R2 and PRD, right? Like not interested in that. Mm-hmm. And except for a very small few handful of people in this city who are nerds about zoning regulations, or perhaps they are civil engineers or whatever, they might show up to such a small group, but yeah. No one else yeah. would come because or you no might one have even said, I've heard of, I've heard of zoning stuff. I get that there's different things. It doesn't, you know, necessarily affect my life. Doesn't I don't think it change I really need life. to study that any deeper. I, yeah. I know everything I need to know. I just know that there are zones. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and I look around my neighborhood and it all seems to be working out pretty fine. You're like, I'm always in the zone, baby. Yeah. 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 R2. R2-D2, <laughs> Star Wars joke, right? I mean, that would be me, right? Yeah. Well, now that they're wanting to make a zoning change, this changes everything for me because my knowledge and understanding of the zoning regulations will have a direct impact on my life, the safety of my, like my kids being on the street, um, what my neighborhood's going to look like, property value, all of the, like, there's a lot of things about my life that are going to be impacted by my knowledge of mm-hmm. the zoning regulations, particularly the zoning change. Does this make sense? Yeah. So yeah. I have, I have voluntarily subjected myself to reading about these things and reading the the process and the, you know, the Robert's rule of order rules of how things get passed and 
When are the, I'm going to meetings. I'm showing up at the city hall for the first time in my life. I've never cared because it directly impacts my life. Mm -hmm. The knowledge of those regulations has an impact on my behavior. And Mm -hmm. by the way, it's changing how I'm interacting with my neighbors. I'm like making signs and I'm putting signs around my neighborhood and we're all organizing, right? Because this very small, obscure detail information has an impact on how we live our lives. Is this yeah. a helpful analogy in any way? Do you think, or do you think people are like totally lost? Well, this one little, I think this little hook at the end, and that is you want now to teach people not simply to have an awareness or an understanding of you know various zoning things, you want it to affect their behavior. So you want right. to teach them with enough detail about this stuff where yeah. it drives them to react and live a different way, if you will, that being also show up for the planning and zoning commission meetings and the city council meetings and, uh, and express their yeah. opposition. Of course, you hope that they will join you in your quest and they will also be opposed to this action. So yeah, not I, only- I spent my own money to buy signs. <laughs> like it impacted how I spend in my money. I spent hours this this past weekend, like driving around my neighborhood, giving signs to people who had asked for one. And I even went up to neighbors who didn't ask for one and said, do you want one of these? You know, I'm like evangelizing my neighborhood. Yeah, with, uh, that's, yeah. you're trying and to make I converts had, over there. You want to join the I had one neighbor who said, I don't <laughs> think I want a sign. And I was like, in, inside I want to be like, but don't you know how this is going to impact your life? You know what I mean? That's so great. Uh, I had another neighbor who said, who she, she's on our little Facebook group. And she said, um, I'm, I support the cause, but I don't want to sign in my neighborhood oh. or uh, in my yard. And I was like, are you ashamed of the cause? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And my son was with me and he said, why wouldn't she want to sign? And I'm like, you know what? That's, wow. I don't, I don't know. Wow. You this, know, is, this is rich stuff. This is here, getting man. really deep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually hope that this is a good metaphor and actually has prompted some deep reflection for me. I'm like, this is, this is energizing me in a way that the Bible sometimes doesn't. Mm. And it, and how I'm kind of ashamed of that. Like, mm. well, you know, studying the word should energize me so much more because it has so much more to say about my life and my behavior and my neighbors. Yeah. Right. And hey, so will you put a Jesus sign in your yard? A hundred percent. Yeah, definitely. At this point, for sure. I've learned my lesson. But what I want to tell you, listener, and I hope you're still listening and didn't just totally tune out because I'm talking about zoning. I actually think this is, at least for me, it's been a really good metaphor. Like, if you had just tried to sell me on getting to know the regulations in my city, that is not something I care about. But the second that I, someone is explaining to me how this zoning change impacts my life Mm -hmm. it's a different ball game yeah now now am i not only studying it it's impacting the way i'm interacting with my neighbors yeah the mistake that we've made as it comes to biblical literacy is we're just trying to sell folks on wouldn't it be nice if you knew more about the bible Mm -hmm. most people think i know enough i know the basics Mm -hmm. i know that there is a bible and if i need it it's a good reference book i can go back to it um and so because we treat it that way because we treat the Great Commission as if it says, teach teach them to know everything I commanded you versus teach them to observe. Yeah. It has trickled down to no wonder people at best, they're posting bad theology memes on Facebook. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, to maybe summarize first the first point, point teach yeah. to the depth. Bow on that for me, AJ. <laughs> teach, teach to the depth of life change, life transformation. Uh, yeah. Don't, don't keep it. Don't keep it up where it's not like, eh, okay, eh, that was good. Maybe, maybe right. not today. Communicate why it's important that people learn it. Yes, which is a good segue into our second point. Um, since, yeah, we certainly want to talk about the why. Uh, but as we teach the what, let's also instruct on developing the how. So mm-hmm. you, you seminary guys, I'm not counted among you, um, that have uh, perfected these skills that are taught, um, pass that on. So, uh, you know, too many, too many pastors are, are content, you know, just doing a great study on their own, bringing a great word. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, 
Um, but it only takes just a, sometimes just a few more words on, on, a, on a sentence um, or maybe one extra point that you could teach them to learn better. Mm-hmm. Uh, and boy, have I benefited from that. You know, just sitting under the, under the tutelage of some really great, um, super smart and really um, amazing leaders and pastors uh, for most of my adult life. Um, I've just benefited immensely from that in understanding, you know, not, uh, not even understanding the concepts, understanding how they came up with the understanding of the concepts. That's what we're talking about in this point. Teach people mm-hmm. to learn um, how to learn well. So, and there's great resources out there for that. Yeah, I have a few thoughts on this. So f- first, I, there's a, um, like, there's a saying you people say, well, you don't want to teach people what to, what to know or how to, what to think, but how to think. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, you got to teach people what to think also, you know, it's, you, you can't just do, you can't just tell people two plus two equals four and you can't just t- teach people the concepts behind addition. You kind of have to teach them both. Like you teach a kid two plus two equals four. And here's how you can know that you teach them both things. Mm-hmm. Similarly, don't just teach people what's what it says, what scripture says. You need to teach them how to know that. I think there's two things at play on why we don't do this very well. One is a competency bias. So if you've been in, if you, you know, if you've gone to seminary, particularly if you went to Bible college or you know, went to some liberal Christian liberal arts school like I did, and you got some ministry related degree, and then you went and did seminary on top of that you know, you start to just go, well, everyone knows this. Um, everyone knows that when you approach scripture, you're going to do it in this way. You know, here's how you go across the interpretive bridge and here's a, a good resource to use. And, you know, you, you just start to get used to these things. And so you start to think, I don't need to tell people this because it's obvious. It is not obvious how to do these things. Yeah. And so um, don't assume that just because you know how to do it, that other people know how. Yeah, I think another factor at play too is the is an imposter syndrome situation where you think, you know, I had a really good teacher. I'm not a really good. I'm not a really good teacher on teaching how to study scripture. Therefore, I'm not going to do it. Mm-hmm. And what right do I have? Especially maybe AJ, you said you know you you didn't go to seminary, so mm-hmm. maybe you think, oh, I shouldn't be one to, who teaches someone how to do that. Well, if you have knowledge on how to study scripture, you should mm-hmm. pass that on, and don't yeah. think that just as you don't have the letters behind your name doesn't mean you shouldn't pass on that ability, that skill. Yeah. yeah. So, um, well, um, you know, we've, <laughs> okay. Hashtag modern relevance, you know, um, it used to be understood. We all had enough knowledge to determine uh, the gender of most humans. And now we're being told maybe you need to be a biologist to do that. So I think we previously, <laughs> We had instructed people well enough to to understand something. Um, so uh, I shouldn't laugh at that. I know that people that's like a real challenge that ministry folks are dealing with, but it is uh, it's still I yeah, can't wrap my around that one. Uh, so there you go. Um, as we teach the what of scripture, let's also sprinkle in some how and uh, yeah, teach 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 them to fish, teach them to fish. Yeah, maybe on, before we move on like a practical application of that. Um, so what I wouldn't recommend you do is transform your whole sermons, you know, time into yeah. like into a, a seminary deep, class, yeah. a seminary class. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That would be real boring, but you can sprinkle in, um, you can sprinkle some things in like uh, a common thing that, that a pastor might do is say, um, this word in Greek means such and such. Yeah. Sprinkle in something extra on top of that and go, you know, um, I was using Blue Letter Bible, mm-hmm. which is a, a free online resource. And I was doing a deep study on this word in the Greek and then go on with what you were going to say. Yeah. So now you have someone could make in the, a note in their margin, a Blue Letter mm-hmm. Bible. I want to look into what that is, mm-hmm. uh, you know, or I was uh, reading this commentary or and name the commentary some some of you probably already do that uh again you don't want to do too much of this because it's going to distract from your main application but just a little bit even Mm -hmm. in your sermons will help people be equipped to go okay here's a tool that i can use 
yeah, little peek behind the curtain of how you how you develop this week's word. So yeah, that's good. Okay, um, our next point is to teach through multiple venues. And this one has kind of a couple of different angles through it. Um, in the in light of, uh, again, we kind of started off talking about teach to obey and, and we teach a, a great deal on uh, the mandate for the church and the Great Commission. We also spend most of our time on developing great discipleship pathways for people. And so maximizing the time that we have with people is super important. I mean, you know that. Uh, how, how hard is it to get people to engage in hardly anything beyond your, your Sunday morning worship service? So um, utilizing other venues to teach deeper concepts is something that you should really um, consider investing in. And this has been a practice of the church for a long time, but we're talking about maybe utilizing some other avenues now. The way that that has historically been done, in addition to Sunday, has been Sunday evening or Wednesday night or Sunday school and small groups and additional Bible studies that are happening at all times um, and days during the week. So we've, we've added, we already are used to this. We've added lots of venues, and usually most of them are focused in on, you know, greater understanding of scripture. Um, but we want to encourage you to look at some offline ways as well that uh, you can provide some stuff out there that people can. Or they may be online, but off online, campus. offline, uh, offline, yeah. meaning not up at the church. Uh, yeah, in right. this context, <laughs> online, yeah. offline. Uh, yeah, things that people can take, maybe even in some smaller or bite-sized chunks uh, that can Im increase the literacy of your people, uh, hopefully, again, for the point of a greater level of uh, life transformation. Yeah, you know, simple things. Like, I, I like the Bible Project podcast. I don't yeah. say that I always agree with how they interpret certain things. That's okay. But what it does do is it prompts me to reflect on things. You know, they'll say something and I go, man, I haven't thought about that. Like just, mm -hmm. just this week, I was reflecting one episode. They were talking about um, Abraham and Moses both functioning as mediators for the people, which caused me, they weren't talking about First John, but it made me want to poke back into First John chapter two, where John is talking about Jesus as being our advocate. Not only is he the sacrifice, but he's our advocate. And so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking on these things and that's just a, it's a podcast that's prompting me on my own to think and reflect and meditate yeah. on scripture more. The Bible Project Classroom Resources um, online, that's really good. If you've not gone on there, you should go to, uh, not a sponsor or anything, but go to bibleproject.org and click on the classroom um, stuff. They in-depth studies, like seminary level type things. And so if you're a solo pastor and you're like, I, I don't have time to put this stuff together. And maybe you don't like the Bible project folks and you, there's something else. Connect people to some other resource that you do trust. Um, a, a great book that I like is this book, uh, Grasp, Grasping God's Word. I know a lot of seminary students get um, assigned to this book. It's really good. Um, it's also very accessible. You don't need to be a seminary student to understand this one. Um, it's written for like at a very basic and fundamental level. So point people have books like this available for people to buy um, or, you know, the old school church library, revive that sucker mm -hmm. and have a section for how to study the Bible um, and, and get people connected to these things. So you don't, it doesn't just need to be a Sunday school class or just a sermon, find other ways for people to begin to invest themselves in learning how to study study scripture. Um, I think it's really important that it not just be one avenue, because if it's just one avenue, you're not going to catch everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So we've talked about teaching people to obey. We've talked about teaching them how to study the Bible and then using the opportunities to, um, in printed form, in online, in audio only, in videos, all these different resources that you can use to help increase the, the literacy oh. of your people. Sorry, another idea. Some churches right. do this. And I, I really think you listeners should think about this. And as podcasting people, we can tell you it doesn't take that long to put a podcast together, right? Obviously, by the quality of this one. <laughs> uh, no, we, we, it's not that it's not that difficult to put a podcast together. Yeah. Man, how much of a blessing would it be if the Monday after your your sermon, you put a podcast like 
how the sermon was made. Mm-hmm. And yeah, don't put it in cool. your brain. Don't think, oh, this needs to be a podcast that's listened to by millions of people around the world. No, it's just make it for your church. And if other people yeah. listen to it, great. But that would be a resource that would serve your folks. That's another mm-hmm. way to show, not just teach them what, but teach them how. Yeah. A behind that's the sermon. That could be cool. Podcast. It'll yeah. drive conversations. I mean, you know, yeah. Me and, me and Scott this morning, when we should have been recording this podcast, we spent an hour, you know, <laughs> talking about all kinds of, I mean, we started off in the book of Exodus. Uh, we, yeah. we were, they we were we Samuel, Matthew 5. All and... kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, so yeah, we both listened to the same podcast and then we're, then we're like, what do you think about this? We're, you know, debating issues and, um, it's, it's a great driver of conversation. Um, and it's a way to, you know, to just raise the level of your church. So, um, and coming back to, you know, our original thing, let's keep our people from putting bad theology out there into the world. I mean, it's just not, <laughs> it's just not good. Yeah. Um, you don't have to confront them online, by the way, you don't have to be like, <laughs> This is bad theology. You may want to. I, I wanted to do that when I saw that today, um, yeah. but I resisted. Instead, I my response is this episode of the podcast. Like, let's 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 improve biblical literacy in our. Put your arm around that person next Sunday and go. I have got a new podcast episode. I would love <laughs> to get your opinion on. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that and that. Uh, podcast would be episode 142 of the church revitalization podcast which you are listening to right now so you can read my notes on this topic at malpersgroup.com forward slash 142 and um, please if you've got other ideas on how to increase biblical literacy in your church we would love to hear what they are and we can see them if you put them in the comments on the uh, youtube channel we've we've got a video you can see our faces on youtube um, and That's so subscribe there, put your comments there. We, we respond to those comments. One of us does. It'll be me or it'll be AJ or someone from our team. Someone on our respond. team. Let's just say someone on our team. Yeah. That sounds really makes us sound very important. Um, <laughs> I'll just, full disclosure. It's usually me or AJ or one other, <laughs> one other person on our team who's re- replying to those, uh, comments, but at any rate, we'd love to hear them. Uh, so check us out on, on YouTube as well. Like, subscribe, do all the things, yeah, rate yeah. us on your podcasting platform. Those things help get out the word as well. It's one thing you can do to help decrease biblical literacy is by making sure this podcast podcast gets heard by more people. Grab one of our finest quotes and make your own meme. That's right. Yes. Do that. <laughs> that would be great. All right. Thanks for joining us this week on the Church Revitalization Podcast. We'll be back with you next week with another great episode.